Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And today we will be looking at ways to help us accomplish doing the will of Yahuwah, having the mind of Yahusha and bearing the emotional fruit of the spirit. We are going to be looking at seven keys to gain self-mastery in Yahusha. And I've listed three aspects to accomplish this. The same three aspects that Yahusha demonstrated for us, doing the will of Yahuwah, having the mind of Yahusha, and bearing the emotional fruit of the spirit by calling our bodies into submission to his spirit. In Galatians 5.22 and 23, we read, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustworthiness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no Torah. There is no law. So we are a tripartite being, a soul. And that soul is made up of mind, will, and emotions. But as believers, we desire to have the mind of Yahushua carry out the will of the father just like he did and bear the fruit of the spirit through our emotions our actions words and deeds and we've learned in the past that there's three states of mind if you will and one state of mind leads toward the fantasy side does it not the fantasy side, the very worldly, earthy side. And then the other is the reality of walking a new set apart life. And when we first come to him as believers, we may have a lot of carnality still in us. We're making a big transition and he's sanctifying us. He's teaching us. He's patient with us as babes, because that's what we were and then we we get a little bit closer to sound mindedness but we still kind of vacillate between the two and and that's not the greatest place to be in either being double-minded because that makes us unstable in all of our ways does it not we want a little bit of the world we want a little bit of yahushua and that really doesn't work but with time, we see that and we move closer to our reality as born anew believers. And we develop sound mindedness. And that is the mind of Yahusha. So some things in life may be as easy as one, two, three, and ABC, but accomplishing this particular one, two, three is always a work in progress of the heart. So we need to look at what is in our hearts. And we know Yahushua set forth for us the perfect example because Yahushua is, was, and always will be perfect. And though we may not be perfect, we can make great strides in genuinely drawing ever closer to him. That requires us dying to self and our selfish ways and living a life pleasing to him. You know, we often ask one another, what would you like to do today? But do we ever ask Yahuwah, what would he like to do today? After all, it is no longer we that live, right? But Yahushua lives in us and through us. He has purchased us with his own precious blood.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we need to ask ourselves, do we have a heart knowledge of Yahuwah with a zealous passion to know him? Or do we only have a head knowledge of him and feign obedience to him? Feign means to give a false appearance of, induce as a false impression, or to assert as if true or pretend. And pretenders are prevalent these days. We run across them in the marketplace. We run across them at work. We run across them in families. Pretenders live in a lukewarm existence, a rebellious existence, a double-minded and or carnal-minded existence, which equates to a worldly-minded existence. We have all run across people in the workplace that are just putting in their time for a paycheck while others perform their work with excellence because that is built into their work ethic or character. Pretenders may get by in this world, but will not prevail before Yahuwah. He tells us in Revelation 3, chapter 16, so because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's from Yahusha. So I found that today's Torah portion, Vayera, really spoke to what we were going to be looking at today, the theme of mastery. And so I inserted this clip. So let's take a listen to the opening introduction to this week's Torah portion by Ira, which means I appeared, because Yahusha will be appearing soon. And now is the time to be very honest with ourselves. Where do our hearts and desires lie? Now, I love this Torah portion as we progress through now in the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus. So turn in your scriptures to Shemot, Exodus chapter 6. Now, of course, we're getting into the theme, the thematic part of scripture here of the plagues, the infamous plagues that are, of course, inflicted upon the Egyptians. And this is all because Pharaoh refuses to let the children of Israel go. Whatever is in his heart is strengthened. And we'll get into that because that is really the case of man, the case of man. Whatever is in my heart, it is going to be strengthened. So really, we have to do a self-inventory. And for the last generation scattered in the nations, you and I should have a hope and an ever-present expectation that Yahweh is going to deliver us to. Because if you don't, then what are you doing here? I want Yahuwah to deliver us all from ourselves, from sin, and from this world. It's a natural process and a supernatural process, and they come together in perfect Ruach HaKodesh unity. He's going to deliver us from this world, and he is going to lead us into the land. Of course, we know that that is the millennium, and we start to practice that today by keeping the Sabbaths, by keeping the feasts. These are all holy rehearsals for, as Paul says, good things to come. But this is not only a physical quest. This is a spiritual quest. But we must first do the natural because we must engage naturally. We have to leave this world. We must engage naturally. And we do that by keeping the Sabbaths and keeping the feasts and aligning ourselves naturally in this natural world with Yahuwah's scriptures. Too many get sidetracked in learning, and it becomes just mental assent. They mental assent the Sabbath, mental assent the feasts. That's not keeping the Sabbath. That's not keeping the feasts. 
It has to be practical. We have to practice it in our homes. If you're not practicing the Sabbath in your home, and you're not practicing the feasts in your home, then you're not keeping the Sabbath and the feast. It's just some kind of mental idea that you've aligned yourself with. And that is a ripoff to you and to your families because we need to see the change in our children. We need to see a generation that is excited about Sabbath that is approaching. And then when it has approached, that is the time the family comes together. And we must do biblical things, biblical ways, all the time in the house. Otherwise, I fear it's just mental assent. And I see too much learning and not enough practical application. Oh, I believe in the Sabbath. Oh, I believe in the feasts. But it's here. And it's not... My children, they look forward to the sap. They know when it comes. They know when it departs. And it's something that is different. And that day is distinctly different from all other days. And we have a biblical culture at home. Because it has to be lived out. And if you, you'll start to see it in your children, especially when they get to the age that my children are at. They're either excited about it or... Mm, no, just kind of go along with it. They've got to be excited about it. We must engage with our children. We cannot have mental assent to Yahoo's feasts and festivals because then we're no different than Israel enslaved in Egypt. It was only when they started to practically change in their homes that life changed. Passover, a feast of the home. Sabbath is a Sabbath of the home first. So please hear me on that because I see too many people that are entangled up in the world and they've got the mental ascent, but they haven't got the practical family lifestyle. It's got to be something that your children look forward to and talk about the scripture, the Bible every day. It's got to be a part of your family life. And if you're by yourself out there, then you need to intimately come in fellowship with Yahusha and implement it with him daily, every day. So all that to say this, we must engage spiritually. We must leave our mental and emotional entanglements and worldly viewpoints behind. We've got to ascend out of the chaos and prayer brings us into his presence. And that's a mountain presence. So here, the Torah is going to be building and building and building to eventually, you know, quite some time later, Joshua will bring Israel home, Yehoshua, and the prophecies build up. And even the King Jimmy translates in Acts chapter 7, verse 44, 45, that Yeshua is the new Joshua. And this is one of those places where they, they translated Joshua and Jesus, and there was this confusion in the King Jimmy many, many, many years ago. And you can look at that, how that appears in your King James Bible in Acts chapter 7, verse 45. But going back to our Parsha, we're going to see so many similitudes with today because we'll have to endure plagues in these last days. We'll have to endure cosmic disturbances. And ultimately, you and I get to triumph. How? Because we became into relationship with the blood of the Lamb. It wasn't mental ascent. It is practical and it is a supernatural change. And that is what makes us be able to partake of the blood of the Lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. Now the keys to our final exodus are, and I put this up in the, the um, description for you, is Passover. Firstly, how do we approach the master's table? How do we approach in a pagan way of syncretism? Or do we approach the master's table from the way we're told to right here in the book of Shemot? Secondly, what about Yahweh's altar? And here we're going to see Moshe and Aaron go before Pharaoh, and we are going to see representations from the altar coming out before Pharaoh. So how should we approach that? And then also, 
we need to realize, and this is hard, especially when we look out on the world today and we see so much suffering and many people that you love and care about, but they, they haven't awakened to the awakening that you and I have. And it's kind of bittersweet. I'm so thankful that I'm awakened to the things that I was once slumbering in. But then it saddens me greatly to see so many that I care about that are slumbering and have no desire to awaken. We need to know, of course, that some were created for destruction and some for glory. And we can have all of our prayers about Pharaoh, but Paul tells the Romans that Pharaoh was created for a specific purpose, was he not? for destruction and that's a bitter pill to swallow that is a bitter pill to swallow it all depends on whether you are being abated and transformed in the heart or if you're being left to your own desires and they will be strengthened and you will become buttressed in heart because at the end of the day yahuwah is trying to touch the heart of man to change it and that is the beginning of your redemption. Now, finally, we all need to be encouraged from the witness of Aaron and Moshe. Because you and I need to have intercessors. We need to have counselors. We need to have guides. We need to have mentors. We need to have mediators that will help and aid us, even speak and assist you in your life if you come into difficult trying situations Moshe was slow in tongue but Yahweh prepared a voice for him so you can always be assured that when you're with Yahweh that he will give you the tools and the skills or the people to help you to get where you need to go whatever it is that you have to stand before will you still have to stand before what you have to yes but he will give you the tools to be able to do it. There is so much to see in the scripture today. And Elohim spoke to Moshe. This is a mild rebuke in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word here is dibre. He spoke to Moshe and said to him, I am Yahuwah. And I appear to Avraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov as El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahuwah, was I not known to them? And I have established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, where they were strangers. Now look at your translation, and you're going to see different translations specifically with verse 3. Is it a question? Is it a statement? I think it's a question. Um, but anyway... Regarding verse 3, what the Henry does that mean? Because I thought that Abraham knew Yahweh, didn't you? I mean, you see the yod hey wah hey all the way back from Bereshit, Genesis. But here he says, by my name Yahweh was I not known to them. So I do think it's a question, not a statement. Because we know that Abraham knew Yahuwah. The patriarchs did know Yahuwah's name. It wasn't a mystery. But here, something different is happening. Yahuwah is going to manifest himself fully to Moshe. What do I mean? You see, to the patriarchs, El Shaddai performed miracles that didn't disrupt nature. But here, you're going to see that Yahweh is going to manifest himself fully, fully to Moshe, and he is going to disrupt the natural world. He is going to disrupt nature in a way that mankind has never, ever seen before. With the patriarchs, he nurtured and comforted them. And he brought them from generation and generation. El Shaddai, he was the nurturer and comforter of the generations. That once Abraham crossed over from the era of Chaldees, he came onto better soil. He became an Ivri. He was one that crossed over, a Hebrew, an Ivri, one who crossed over from bad soil to good soil to produce a generational blessing if he stayed in the El Shaddai the Elohim's 
shad, breast, dye is sufficient. And he stayed in the bosom of the father, and therefore he had all the comfort to his generations. But now there's going to be something that is going to be manifest so greater. It's going to extend past the limited generations, and now it's going to be national in scope. It's not just going to be a generational blessing restricted to a line. It's going to be national in scope, and it's going to change the order of the world even to the heathen. Do you and I expect such a change as that? Well, the book of Revelation says that the world will see the changes too. It's not going to be just restricted to believers. It's going to be manifest on a worldwide scale. So verse 3, I believe it should be viewed as a question. But by my name, Yahuwah, was I not known to them? But they never did question him. But here you are, Moshe, questioning me they saw all my attributes but they never questioned but you you're questioning you see this is interesting because Yahusha makes the same equitable inquiry to his followers right before the Passover right before the Passover Yahusha made the same equitable inquiry to his followers as Yahuwah does to Moshe here in verse 3 It's bookend linguistics. John 14, verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Master, show us the Father, and it sufficeth. And Yahushua said to him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, Show us the Father? A question, an equitable question. And then in John chapter 20, verse 29, Yahushua saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, but blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and I. That's you and I. So now we look at verse 5 in chapter 6 of our text, and we hear now. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. You'll never come to the Passover unless you groan. You'll never come to faith unless you groan. There has to be a point in your life when you're just like, oh, what did I do to myself? What did I do to myself? And you groan. How did all my decisions led me to this? Well, so now I should just pick up a Bible and stand on the side of the corner and and preach the gospel. How can I do that? I'm such a hypocrite. I'm such a wicked man. There is no hope for me. I can't pretend to be righteous. There is nothing good, no good. Oh, my, I'm lost. I could go and maybe I should join a monastery. Maybe I should go to India and, 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 and go on a pilgrimage. And I thought about, and it would all end up still with me and the decisions I'm and the man that I really am in my own natural, natural realm. Evil. evil but when you understand the passover and the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world that's the only message that made sense to me that someone could live a perfect sinless life and be at one and an atoning covering and that if i walked in faith and applied that to my life then I could be transformed and become a new creation and the old man is reckoned dead. That's the only message in all the religions of the world, in all the mysticism of the world that is true because it is the person of truth, Yahushua, the way, the truth, and the life. And that is it. So how do we break free from the old man? 
and walk as being part of the one new man in Yahushua HaMashiach. It is not that you leave your unique personality traits behind, but you edify your strengths and work on your weaknesses within the confines of covenant Torah. You are special. You are one of a kind. There has never been another you, and there never will be. Yahuwah already knows the plans he has for us, plans of good and not of evil, plans for a future and a hope. It is our desire to grow into those plans as we constantly seek him and use our Yah-given gifts for his kingdom. Last week, we looked at seven perfect ways to transcend every situation as we walk in our sanctification process. And for me, I view these as seven affirmations of blessings that we should say aloud each day. And I put a screenshot of those for us just to go by. And I sent you all a Word document with this same list. And what Matthew did was take the Hebrew words and compiled them into a affirmation, seven affirmations, if you will. And it reads, I have turned and faced the showbread, committed to change my behaviors from this day forward, knowing he will tend to me and be my companion and friend. I commit to walk beyond my senses, my emotions continually with my priest, our high priest and teacher who has bought me and also brought me back from death. He alone is my revenger and deliverer from all natural and moral evil, hurt, pain, and sorrow. I am set free from my own wretchedness. In him, we have had a status change, a big status change. Matter of fact, we have become a new creation in him. Our very soul, our very being, our DNA hard drive, if you will, has been recorded in heaven. Yes, recorded in heaven. This one was born there. We read about that in Psalm 87, verse 5. And of Zion, it is said, each one was born in her, for the Most High himself does establish her. Yahuwah, not just anybody. <laughs> Yahuwah does right in the register of the peoples. This one was born there, Selah. And in this week's daily devotional, we came across Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. For whoever does the desire of my father, so for whoever does the will of my father, who is in the heavens because he's omnipresent is my brother and sister and mother. So last Shabbat, Matthew covered seven keys to gain self mastery in Yahuwah in becoming the upward prophetic soul you were created to be. These are tools and tools are meant to be used and also keys are meant to unlock. Tools in your garage or workshop are used to make or fix something. A person must pick up the tools, learn how they work, 
then apply them to the task at hand. We are not going to get these seven keys by listening to a teaching one time. We must put the time, energy, risk, and love into our sanctification process. That is why I'm so excited when we come together to review insights that will truly bless each one of us in special ways because we are all unique and he knows us and he knows what we need. He knows the manna to feed us. I listed the seven keys on the screen as a reference as we listen to this excerpt by Tour to the Tribes explaining each one. Then we will briefly summarize and apply them along with the five V's that, will, that we will soon review about dealing with our emotions and those emotions that we see manifested by others. And that will be done by Bob, Pastor Bob Strakehan. So let's pause. Let's seriously feed on these seven keys, absorb them, own them, understand them. I want to talk a little bit about natural law. I want to talk a little bit about manifestation. I want to talk a little bit about attraction. Because people don't realize what you put out there, you will attract. What you say comes back to you. I want to look, talk a little bit about polarity. I might even touch on the law of gender. Are you allowed to say such things? Is there any such thing as gender? I'd like to talk about trans. Mutation, not the other kind of trans, transmutation. Because remember, this whole series, we're trying to make it relatable so that we can be better and keep ascending in self-mastery. Ascending to Yahuwah through self-mastery. So, there are laws that are in place that remain there whether you believe in them or not. Are we clear on that? And this is where secular humanists fail to see the peril of their folly. What we manifest will determine whether we can achieve the things that we want. We need to vibrate at a certain frequency of our desired object, which of course has to be aligned with the creation. Because if we don't vibrate in a certain frequency that's in a line with Yahuwah, then we'll never re be able to receive the blessing because it doesn't actually exist. It's just imagery. It's just fakery. If we vibrate in a frequency that is against nature, then we will live a life of frustration and failures. And that's what happens with so many of these people. They live a life of frustration and failures that they then actually start turning against their own body. Because they're vibrating at a frequency that is against nature. It's cause and effect. It's the natural law. It's not my law. It's just like gravity. And you are subject to it in an instant, even if you're this or that or a multi-billion trillion gazillionaire. It doesn't matter because it's natural law. Secondly, we must seek for things that you can give and that you can work for. Because you cannot attract love in your life if you don't give it. You can't have friends if you're not a friend. You can't attract forgiveness if you don't give forgiveness. Forgive your enemies. Forgive those that seek to entrap you and, snap and, and set traps and snares for you. Forgive them because you'll get forgiveness in your life. It's the law of attraction. 
You can't attract love if you don't give love. You can't attract friends if you don't be a friend. You can't attract wealth if you don't give wealth. And you certainly can't attract forgiveness if you're not willing to forgive. Think about that. It's natural law. It doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. You know it's true. A man who isolates himself seeks his own. He's got no friends. Why? Because he's isolated himself. All right, so I will touch on the law of gender just because I can. And it's kind of part of the subject matter. And this is a real problem for the inhabitants of Sodom. The law of gender is a real problem for anyone in the vicinity of Sodom or Sodomites. It's a real problem. Why? Because you see, there are two types of spiritual energy, male and female, masculine energy and feminine energy. This law should inspire us to balance these two energies within us. When it is out of balance, then unsoundness of mind takes a hold within. Everybody has masculine and feminine energy because you came from a mother and father. But when those energies are out of balance, that is when unsoundness of mind comes into effect. So what we actually have here is unsoundness of mind today. Just because something that should be taught at school, the law of gender, balance, isn't taught. So they become so totally out of balance that then brings unsoundness. I mean, this was... The ancients knew about this. Philosophy and theology. I mean, this... But now, because people are in re-education camps, they're not teaching this. It's just common sense. You have masculine energy and feminine energy. Then you balance the two energies within you, and then you ascend into everything that Yahuwah was created you to be. But when those energies become unbalanced, you become unsound with mind, and the next thing, you're chopping off body parts. And now you're addressing the body instead of addressing the origin of the problem which is an imbalance that has affected your thinking. What a concept. We should be addressing the mind and the soul of man. Instead, we're going to the base elements, the body, the body. That's just the basis element. Why would we go to the base? Because it's all about going to the base. The base, the dregs of society. This is what was happening as they were circling the drain in Judah and Jerusalem. Do you not see it today? Having an overflow of one energy over the other is something that leads to absurdity within the mind. The balance or lack thereof between the masculine and feminine energy is the main detriment on whether we can become fully realized beings or not. It's the main determinant, sorry I said detriment, it's the main determinant of whether we can become fully realized beings or not. Meaning if you're unbalanced in those energy fields between masculine and feminine, you will never be what you were created to be because Yahweh didn't create a girl to be unbalanced. And Yahweh didn't create a boy to be unbalanced. He created them to be balanced individuals and be everything that they could be. To be the Sarah and to be the Abraham. To live full and with abundance. So with that little rant, but this is really what was going on in chapter 3. There's actually seven, and I love the, the number seven because it's perfection. There's seven keys to this self-mastery that we've been talking about in this series. About how to become a prophet. How to get that upward trajectory of our soul. 
rather than a downward trajectory of the soul. I'm looking at an upward trajectory of the soul, how to become a prophet for Yahuwah. So let's focus now on seven things, and we'll finish with this, seven things that will tie in with chapter two of an upward trajectory of the soul. Number one, vibration. Number one, vibration. Everything has a vibration to it. Man, I feel some good vibes, right? That's right, man. I got, whoa, wow, I got some good vibes coming from this brother, right? It's kind of like surfer language, right? I can feel the good vibes, right? It's vibration. Have you ever been around so, oh man, I got some bad vibes about that person. Or you go to a place geographically. We went to Chichen Itza. Man, that had some bad vibes. Oh, yes, because the, the Mayans were down there sacrificing people. Thousands of years later, you can still feel some bad vibrations. That's where it comes from. Good vibes, bad vibes. Right? Man, I've got some bad vibes out here on this ocean because Jaws is down there for crying out loud. I'd have some bad vibes too. <laughs> if you ever want me... And if you ever want, people think, you know, oh, Matthew, you know, oh, he's got it all together. I tell you what, if you ever want to see my male and female energy become totally um, unbalanced, make me watch a shark movie. You, I will scream like a girl. <laughs> I mean it, I can't help it. It's, it's, in, it's crazy. If you, I watch a shark movie, I scream like a girl. It's insane. I don't know. It just overcomes me. I can't control myself. My female energy just goes right through the roof and all masculinity has gone. I, I blame my mother. I think she let me watch Jaws before I hit puberty. Late 70s, before I hit puberty. She let me watch Jaws. I tell you, every time I'm triggered, I turn into a big girl. That's the only time that you will ever see my masculine and female energy unbalanced. Sure. sure. All right. Sorry, guys. Number one, the keys to self-mastery, ascending to that spiritual energy is vibration. Everything has a vibe to it. Whatever your vibration, whatever your frequency, or whatever you resonate is what you're going to draw into your life. If you have a downward energy vibration, you're going to get all these hey, depressed people and negative people you're going to draw. Right? If you were a worrier and you're, you're vibrating worrisome, you'll get all these worriers coming towards you. If you're a big vibrational gossip, you'll get all these gossipy drama people vibrating towards you. So be very careful of the energy that you vibrate or deliberately place yourself amongst people that you want to vibrate at that energy. I choose to do that. I deliberately place myself in the company of people that I want to vibrate at that energy level. I go and seek them out. And oftentimes it's uncomfortable for me because I'm not yet vibrating at that energy level, but I'm going to force myself to be in that company because I'm going to learn to bring up my energy level because I'm going to overcome the fear that would keep me down. So I always seek people that vibrate at a higher energy level than me. I've always done that. But it is uncomfortable. Because you're up in your frequency load. You're up in your frequency load. So you have to draw your emotions around any part of your life are your vibration in that area. Think about it. If you're dealing with heavier feelings, your vibration then is a lot heavier and it's lower. If you're in a genuine place of higher emotions, then your vibration is higher and it's lighter. And people just, man, they just want to be around you. Wow. And so light. Yo. Number two. Relativity. Relativity. Everything's relative. 
What a concept. If you're looking at a problem and you're hyper-focusing on that problem, then what happens? What happens when you are absolutely overtired and you so want to go to sleep and you, you, you can't go to sleep? Or you have a speaking engagement and you go, oh, I really, obviously you can see that, you know, I haven't been practicing, that you really want to do well and you hyper-focus on it, you're going to do abysmally. But if you just like step back a little bit and let things open up and you don't hyper-focus on it and you bring in some relativity to what the big picture, then you actually perform better. You'll actually fall asleep. So this is the law of relativity. Everything's relative. Don't super focus on a problem because then it starts to become overwhelming and then the problem magnifies. See things relative to life. See things relative to the world. Keep taking steps back until you can minimize just how big a deal it seems and you maintain perspective. Relativity, that's what this world with the news is trying to do. Getting you to focus, hyper focus on the, everything bad and negative in the world. So then you start manifesting that negativity, fear and terrible stuff because that's what they're projecting at you. Step back. Get into the Word. Get into prayer. Be with your family. Go for a walk in nature. Change your diet. Change your sleep patterns. And all of a sudden, the whole world will open up to you. That's the law of relativity. The third is cause and effect. These aren't my rules. It doesn't matter whether you agree with me or not. It's like gravity. These are part of Yahweh's created order. And the people of Isaiah's day in Judea and Jerusalem... They had fallen out of alignment with these seven principles of his natural creation. And it caused what? Chaos. So the third one is cause and effect. The cause of all your problems. Everything you're dealing with. The cause of your life is what? It's thought mixed with emotion. Everything you're going through. Everything I'm going through is a consequence of cause and effect. My thinking mixed with my emotions. You empower yourself by imbalancing the horse and the rider. Remember we spoke about that? You balance the horse, emotion, with the rider, your thinking, and then you become in alignment with your life. The fourth law is polarity. Polarity. Now, this natural law, this is going to upset the left hards. It really is going to upset the left hards, but I'm sorry. There's the law of polarity. Everything has an opposite. There are two sides. There are two genders. You can't have up without having down. You can't have a left without having a right. And you can't have a masculine without having a feminine. And you can't have a question without an answer. I mean, what a concept. This isn't difficult stuff. But everybody's in confusion just because they don't understand or they haven't been taught the law of polarity. But when you bring it out to people, it's like, oh, oh, oh yeah, that does make sense. I guess you can't have an answer without a question. <laughs> I guess there can't be a, a left without a right. <laughs> yes, and there can't be a male without a female, and there can't be more than two genders. Because this would go against the law of polarity. It doesn't exist. Only in an unbalanced mind could it exist. And then in that, I don't want to know what exists in that kind of mind, because I choose not to have my mind be that way because I want to ascend rather than descend into hell. It's really that simple. You can't have a burning desire for something without a way to achieve it. So make your desires align with Yahweh and you will achieve your hopes and dreams. Whatever you hope and dream for, if you align it with Yahweh, 
you will achieve it. Because you cannot have a burning desire for something without the way to achieve it. That's the law of polarity. The fifth law, gestation. I know you'd like to get the baby out, but you're going to have to go through the time period. I know it's uncomfortable and you can't sleep, but you don't want to rush that stuff. There is a time of gestation. It's called patience. And you have to be patient. It takes time for something to come into its full form. If you rush it, you can endanger the process. Things may move slowly in your life, but they can move faster and faster as you progress in mastery or you come to the time of delivery, right? I mean, you see what I'm saying. These are natural laws of our creator and we bump into them every day. But unless we can actually have them become part of our understanding, we won't really be able to navigate these very difficult situations that we often encounter. Right? Or you won't be able to have a dialogue with somebody that is malfunctioning in their mind. But when they're malfunctioning in their mind, you may then be able to point them to just the base elements of the creation. Because they're not going to go to an in-depth Bible study with you if they're malfunctioning in a mighty way up here. But they may realign with the creation if you're merciful and kind to them. The fifth is rhythm. Rhythm. Everything has rhythm to it. Right, Joshua? Are you sure? Skiing, for example. Skiing. To ski successfully, you have to get in rhythm with the terrain, Joshua. You've got to get in rhythm with the terrain. You've got to be in rhythm with the space in which you inhabit. In life and anything you're working on, you're in rhythm when you're not rushing or doubting or being fearful. Then, then you're riding the slopes. Then you're riding the terrain. You're feeling things out. You're adjusting things. Have you ever been in so much of a hurry that you've dropped all of the eggs? Whereas really, if you'd have just taken the time to maybe carry less eggs and do a couple of trips, you would have saved more time. We have chickens, lots of them, and lots of eggs, and I've seen it overflow in the basket. What a blessing, what a bounty, instead of making a couple of trips with baskets. Rhythm, everything has rhythm to it. We'll get you back up on the slopes, and we'll be checking out that rhythm. A couple of weeks, stitches. The seventh one, transmutation. Transmutation. Now, the transmutation period, this is where most people give up. See, I've, I, this, this is an area that I've spent a lot of my life in. My wife will definitely attest to this. This is the ugly, sticky, messy part. And I've, man, I have met, she's, you know, now my wife, she was falling asleep, and now she's like wide awake. She's like, aha, aha. This is the ugly, messy, sticky part. The seventh law of the creator is transmutation. This is the period when things, things just, you're working on it, and it just goes adrift. You just, you're not comfortable. Feelings like, you know, man, I, I just need to give up. I need to stop. I need to go back. This is just sticky. It's just a, it's just a, what, what, a, what did I do? I've created a mess. But this is all part of transmutation. It's like a caterpillar. A caterpillar has to become a messy glob of goo, but it becomes a butterfly. 
And if it didn't go through that messy transmutation, it could never fly. Transmutation is a period that we have to accept. Acceptance of transmutation allows you to soar. It allows you to soar. I've gone through this in the legal realm. And it has been amazing to be able to now be at the butterfly stage. Okay? But you have to accept the transmutation. You have to be able to accept going through the very messy and uncomfortable part because it's natural. If anything big you're trying to do in your life, you have to allow transmutation. Don't be put off by it. We spoke about this yesterday. For people that really are going to soar in life, they accept transmutation. Because it is the most discouraging part of life. It's the messy stuff. But if you accept it and work through it in your marriage, my darling wife, right? We are products of transmutation. Truly. 27 years of marital bliss. No, we've gone through a lot of transmutation. But we are truly blessed. So at least our children are butterflies. So, vibration, relativity, cause and effect, polarity, gestation, rhythm, transmutation. These are Yahweh's natural laws. Don't care. Don't care if you don't believe them. Don't care. Doesn't matter you're still going to fall off the bloody cliff because it's called gravity. Don't care if you think there's 17 genders. Don't care. Don't care. It's called the law of polarity. Okay? Vibration. Your frequency is off. Go stick your finger in the electric socket and get rebooted. You need a reboot. Your system is about to crash. I mean, it's all very natural, isn't it, when you start looking at it like that? The problems of the world, they seem kind of foolish, don't they? Everything they're trying to fly in your face, it seems kind of foolish when you see the seven laws of creation right there. Puts everything into perspective. Verse 10, say to the righteous that it shall be well with him. If you implement vibration, relativity, cause and effect, polarity, gestation, rhythm and transmutation into your life, it will help you ascend to being well. And you shall then eat the fruit of those blessings. Meaning, if a person merits a reward for a good deed, a mitzvah, that reward in and of itself will bear fruit. It's called the compound interest of blessings. And you get to experience them, even if you go through a transmutation. What you thought was a messy glob in your life actually was the vehicle to get you to fly. The vehicle to get you to fly. It's exciting. It's exciting. I'm going down to Texas next week to be around some of the greatest legal minds in the nation. I would never, ever have had that opportunity. I wouldn't have even thought that I would want to get into that kind of career, if you will, of specialty, technical understanding if I hadn't have gone through a transmutation but because I've gone through it now a whole new world has opened to me with exponential blessings which I would never ever have had the opportunity to go if I'd have given up it's amazing stuff because Yahweh has a plan for our lives if we just 
align ourselves with him, with his natural law, vibrating with Yahuwah at his frequency, and we will be comforted by the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, woe to the wicked, there shall be evil with him, for the bribe of his hand shall be given to him. My nation toys with its legal authorities, and women rule over it. Now, I'll finish up with verse 13 through 26, and we'll, we'll have a quick glimpse at the antithesis of the last verses. So I'm going to look at a quick glimpse of the antithesis of the last verses, 13 through 26, to seek a path of the upward soul trajectory rather than the downward soul trajectory, which of course was the daughters of Zion. Verse 12, the daughters of Zion, they had chosen to go astray and destroy paths. The antithesis of this is what? We need to stay in the paths of Yahuwah. Verse 14, the daughters of Zion were eaten up the vineyard and they destroyed the poor. Meaning the antithesis of that is we need to produce a good vintage of fruit and take care of one another. Verse 15, you beat my people to pieces and shame the faces of the poor. The antithesis of that is we need to walk in honor and integrity and we need to take care of others. Verse 16, you're haughty and you walk with stretched forth necks and seductive eyes. Don't be seduced by Instagram. Walk in meekness. Like Job, make a covenant with your eyes. Job 31, verse 1. And the final verse, verse 26, And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being ruined shall sit upon the ground. The antithesis of that is rejoice in Yahuwah's gates. That's where we should be. That's where the righteous sit in the gates of Yahuwah. Rise in the morning and bless Yahuwah for another day that he's given you. Focus on positive, creative visualization, positive, creative vocalization in prayer, in word, in deed. Set the balance and the frequency of your energy before you go out the door. And only put things into your mind and your eyes and your hearing that is going to let you become the butterfly that Yahuwah wants you to be, to ascend through the mess. There is a better way to live. And Isaiah has always been the prophet to lead us. And that's what I'm excited for. Yes, we're going to go through the transmutation period with Isaiah. The first half of the book, it's messy in places. It's sticky and it's messy in places. But when you get to the latter part of the book of Isaiah, we're a butterfly. It's full of absolute soaring heights but don't be put off through the transmutation seven things to glean for us to truly understand the prophet and self-mastery of the soul number one vibration watch out for those heavier feelings get the lighter emotions going because you'll attract that okay number two relativity don't hyper focus on something Remember, Satan works in imagery, magnification, and projection. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, no, don't. It's relativity. Number three, cause and effect. Balance your horse, emotion, with your rider, your thinking. Get in balance. Number four, polarity. Have kingdom desires. Have kingdom desires. And Yahweh will bring those desires to fruition. That is polarity. Yahweh will give you the means to fulfill your desires when you put your desires in line with polarity. And gestation, the fifth, gestation. Sometimes... You've got to through, go through the process. All of my trials that I thought were terrible, they all began with a process server. And I, 
I didn't know what to do. That process server and the process of transmutation that I have gone through has been the key to my next golden connections in life. And it has changed my whole life for the better in amazing abundance. It's a process. Go through it. You don't get to determine how long you'll be in the gobby glue of transmutation. But Yahweh will be with you. And if you allow yourself to align with him through the process of gobby goopiness, of transmutation, that's gestation. That's the process. And you will get the blessing. King David went through it. Jeremiah went through it. Isaiah went through it. And Matthew went through it. And each and every one of you will have a time in your life when you will go through it. It's what you do when you're going through it that makes all the difference. Everyone in their life will have a transmutation. Most will fight it, fear it, and give up. And they'll never become the butterfly. So he summarized the seven keys, and we're going to do that again real briefly. Vibration, get lighter emotions to achieve higher emotions. Relative, relativity, don't hyper-focus on something. The enemy wants to magnify situations to create a negative reaction. We see that every day on YouTube and BitChute and so forth. Polarity, remember his natural laws are his natural laws. Everything has an opposite. And his natural law is interwoven into his word. And the law of notice is his word. Cause and effect, balance. This is primary. Balance your inner horse and rider, which are metaphors for our emotions being the horse and thinking the writer. Transmutation, it's not a pretty process, but if we accept it and work through it, Yahweh will give us beauty for ashes. The caterpillar will become the butterfly. Gestation, change is, is inevitable. You must go through the process, practice patience in acceptance and honor along the way. Rhythm, everything has a rhythm. For example, when we meet new people, they will speak to us at a certain rhythm. We had a guy come by here uh, yesterday and um, he was with the Geek Squad. I had some computer issues and he was just a nice young man, but he was very soft-spoken and had a gentle quality about him. So I picked up on that and I made sure to speak to him in that type of tone and softness and connect with him, hopefully make him relaxed in the house while he, he worked on that and um, seemed to work. So to flow with that, we try to mirror and we try to mirror that rhythmic pace an energy of speech that may complement or enhance the conversation. If someone comes to you and they're talking 90 to nothing and then you talk to them very slow, then that rhythm is not going to connect with them. They're going to go, oh, okay. So that kind of helps us in our relationship. Another example is when two or more people are cooking in a kitchen. Ha! Rhythm is required in a kitchen. There most certainly is a rhythmic dance or you're booted out of the kitchen, which some may be awkward in the kitchen just to be booted out of the kitchen. So what I see as the main natural law or tool out of these seven 
I placed in the center. And I, that is cause and effect. And you could tell when Matthew was going through all of these, it all seemed to connect back to cause and effect. So I placed that in the center. Achieving balance of our inner horse, our emotions, and rider thoughts. For that reason, I moved it in that center position and I repositioned or paired the other six to form a chiastic structure. So vibration, I kind of connected to the bottom one rhythm, Relativ relativity with gestation, polarity with transmutation. So if our horse and rider are out of balance, our vibe will be off and also our rhythm. A bride and groom must learn each other's vibe and rhythm to form a beautiful dance. Otherwise, there is a constant stepping on each other's toes with great annoyance, thus requiring dance lessons or the dance ceases. When does passion leave a relationship? When the dance ceases. If our horse and rider are out of balance, our thoughts can hyper-focus and magnify an issue out of proportion. That's what S.A. Tan does. He magnifies it and says, oh, this is really, really bad. This is really bad. Did you hear that? Did you watch this? Ooh, this may cause a premature reaction and cut short the full gestation of waiting on Yahuwah's timing. If our timing is off, we have slipped out of his will because we haven't waited on him. But those that wait on Yahuwah, what happens? They renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will ascend. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. If our horse and rider are out of balance, our thoughts are not in line with his natural laws. Transmutation is a natural law. And if we try to rush or change the process, it will not end well. It is the struggle of the butterfly coming out of the cocoon that pushes the blood flow to the wings and finishes the transmutation of a caterpillar into a butterfly. If we snip the cocoon to assist this natural law, we would bring death or injury and the transmutation process would fail and the caterpillar would not become all that Yahuwah had created it to be. Struggle, resistance brings growth and it brings strength. Now, I would like us to view this teaching on the five V's of dealing with emotions by Pastor Bob Strakan. This is just one segment from his series on the fragmented soul. And I highly recommend watching the entire series for this is a gift of Pastor Bob Strakan's. He is truly gifted in this area and you will be blessed. And two people in our Shabbat group are going through this series and they can testify to that. And this particular segment ties in beautifully to what we have been studying in our theme of mastery. And as I said earlier, when we were just fellowshipping before we started our Shabbat study was as his time draws near, as, as he is purposefully drawing close to us in these end of days, his, his spirit has become more alive. And we've gotten into the rhythm of his vibe coming closer to us. We see that the Isaiah study is tying in wonderfully with the fragmented soul series. We also see that the Torah portions are feeding into this. We see his whole word 
coming to life and functioning all together in a beautiful flow, a beautiful vibe, a beautiful rhythm. So I will leave links to this series and also toward to the tribe series on the study of Isaiah. And so just look in the description section below and that's where they will be. So let's take a listen now to the five V's of dealing with emotions, not only our emotions, but helping others deal with their emotions. So we're back on to fragments. So before we start this, let's go with the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Fathers, we come to you today. We come in the name of Jesus. Just pray over this lesson and this message, Lord, and each one here and those that will be watching online and those another time. Lord, that this might be a blessing and a help to each one. It might be strengthened from what you have for us today. And Lord, we pray against anything that would try and hinder or come against us today. And we rebuke this in the name of Jesus, uh, loosing the spirits of truth, love, power, and a sound mind upon us all. Pray for your presence and your protection tonight, Lord, and for each one watching a clear mind uh, to, to hear the, the words that the Holy Spirit will bring to us tonight, Lord, and an understanding that comes from you also. Lord, again, we thank you for all things and just pray you would be with us and bless us now in Jesus' most precious name for his sake. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. All right, so Fragments Old Part 8 is what we're going to be on. Uh, and in the weeks to come, once we've done a few more lessons, we'll have another Q&A session to cover much more stuff. So if there's things you've been dealing with that you get stuck on, um, then we'll, can, those, there was a perfect time to do Q&A for the fragmented soul. Uh, and what we might do is we might do that as a Zoom meeting so that everybody has the chance to come on and we can, we can just talk about those things. So I might not do it on a Friday night. Uh, we might do it later on uh, some other time. So we'll see what we do with that. But um, just leave that with us. Right. So what are the five V's? We've done this every week. Well, almost every week. Every, every week we've had this lesson. So the violation, violation is number one. Ventilation. After we ventilated, we need to validate. Absolutely. And then you don't have to get the V, but if you can, great. Vindicate, but what does it mean? It's more important that you know what it means rather than the word itself. What is it we need to do at this stage? To vindicate something is to, all right, this is really important here, right? So we've, we've had, we've, we've talked, we've had a violation. Something has been done wrong. Um, we have talked about what has happened to us. Uh, we have validated that. In other words, it's okay to feel. We've talked about our emotions. Right now we're talking about the people that have done these things to us. So the vindication stage, we need to do something. Forgiveness, exactly. Forgiveness is the forgiveness stage. It is more important that you remember about the forgiveness where you've got to forgive yourself, forgive others. Some people have to forgive God. Sometimes uh, these things, people have, you know, attitudes towards God that they need to go over. This is the stage that we need to do that. We need the forgiveness stage, but we can't get to the stage until we've been validated. That's just really so important because we don't truly understand what forgiveness is. And, and we will cover that in lessons to come and really get into what forgiveness is. Because what the modern church talks about forgiveness is nowhere near what the scriptures say. Um, you know, it's almost this blanket forgiveness that you're just somebody comes up to you, does something to you, and you're supposed to turn around and forgive them automatically. You know, you know, they're like, oh, you just need to turn the other cheek. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. And our final V is our eviction. And this is getting rid of the things that are dragging you down. All right. Now, this is not necessarily a spiritual thing. It's mainly a spiritual thing, but it can be people in our lives as well. Sometimes we need to evict people from our lives, right? Because they are also, they are the cause of our, vent our, our violations. And so why continually to be violated by these people? We need to evict them from our life. We need to make sure that our, our you know, you know, we say, well, we need to give them the gospel. Well, it, it's yes, it's important to give the gospel, but how is them violating us on a regular basis a good thing? You say, well, it's for the gospel's sake. There's persecution, there's tribulations and trials, but when we have the opportunity to not be violated, then we're going to have to take that option because our health is just as important. Our mental sanity is absolutely important. If we lose our mental sanity, we're no good to anyone. 
All right, so if we're constantly fighting to not be validated or constantly being put down upon constantly, we're not going to be any good for the gospel's sake. And as Jesus said, to shake the dust off the feet, there's some people you, you can try and help. You know, I, I'm, it's been a while since I got, um, got um, somebody from the Flat Earth Society tried to, to school me on it, but that happened again this week. And I asked my usual question. I only have one question, and it's like, can you answer this question? And then, you know, there's the spout back of you're indoctrinated and you're your pridefulness and all this kind of stuff. Watch these. I said, I don't want to watch the videos. I want you to ask, ask me this question. Answer me this question. Oh, but then they start, oh, blah, blah, blah. Your psychology is not going to work. I've never mentioned in the psychology. Never mentioned. I'm asking you a question. This is a scientific question that is, is based on science. It's simple science. And if you can answer that question, which I know you can't, but anyway, that's the point of the question. If you can answer this, I'll listen to you. But if you cannot prove wrong, that, that wrong, then I'm not, I can't listen to anything else you have to say because that is a very simple question that would prove either flat or not. Um, and none, they've never been able to answer the question. I always get, you know, oh, you're too prideful or you've been too indoctrinated. And it's just, it's just more gaslighting that, that most people try to use to try to get you to bend to their way of thinking. You don't need that in your life. Right? If you can't spot the gaslight, I spot it, you spot it, you know, you don't always spot it, but when things are like that, you're ready for it. Right? And, you know, then you make a comedy sketch out of it. <laughs> right? uh, but uh, but when, when things like that, you know, you don't need that on a daily basis. You don't need people gaslighting you on a daily basis, putting you down. So there's time that you must evict people from your life because it's just of no worth. It's, it's occupying your time that you could take time to study, be praying, witnessing, enjoying life, relaxing, resting. Those are important things, working, whatever it might be. These Sometimes there are people sent to just steal time from us. Well, the scriptures say redeeming the time because the days are evil. So, like I said, it's not just spiritual. Sometimes there's people that we need to evict from our life. All right, and it's very important. If you want to know more, go back to a couple of months. It was, I think it was about six or seven months ago. We talked about about that, about how important you are to the Lord. And I might stick a lesson about that and refresh that and just condense it into one. Uh, when we come to eviction, and we may just look at that specifically a bit more. So let's go to validation. That's what we're talking about tonight. Okay. So validation, here's rule number one, a rule I say, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it really is a fact that you can't really validate until you've heard the ventilation, All right? If you've not heard them talk about what's been going on, you can't tell them they're, they're right to feel that way. So for example, somebody's, somebody's really angry and they're mad, say, what are you mad about? Oh, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be angry. Well, you can't, you can't say that because you don't know what the, what's happened. And then they tell you, say, what's happened? Oh, I just lost a tenner on the, on the dogs, right? <laughs> you see? So if we've told them it's okay to be angry, then they're like, oh, well, no, that's your own stupid fault, you know, for gambling. But anyway, you know, there's these kind of things. So it's very important that we understand why uh, and w where those things are coming from. So until we have heard the ventilation, uh, we cannot validate the situation. So that's very important. Remember that. Don't try to validate before um, you've heard the ventilation. Don't even say to people, it's okay to be angry um, until we come to the validation part. Okay, we don't need that. We need to see raw emotions. We need to see things that are real, not the things that are put on. Because sometimes when you, if you, I've seen people try to do that before and they say, you know, tell me all the, the you, get, you know, tell me all your ventilation and stuff like that. And, you know, and, and tell me all your emotions as well. And, no, because then you're just leading the person. Same with the thing if we're trying to do it for ourselves, we're just leading ourselves. You know, when you're trying to give a witness statement, you don't put in your emotions. You know, he said, well, how did you feel about that? Oh, well, so, or, or made me feel such and such. If it's, if it's natural, then it's fine. You know, I was really afraid and they came in and I was, oh, I was petrified. That's fine. That's natural. You know, uh, and we can ask, how, do we, how did you feel uh, in that way? And we'll get proper responses. Uh, rule two, validation is not getting someone to agree with our actions or decisions. Right? So there are some times where people will do something or they will have done something, or they've made a decision, and they just want you to agree with them. Right? Anybody ha ever had that? Somebody's done something, 
and they just want you to agree with it to make it okay. You ever had that? Yeah, that's not validation, right? It is a validation of sorts, but it's not in this context what we're meaning, you know, because that's not how things work, right? We seek counsel before we make the decision, right? Not afterwards, right? Have we made the right decision, right? We don't want someone just to try and agree to with us, right? If, we, if we've made a smart decision, it's panned out, well, that was a good decision. And some will agree with us because it was a smart decision. There's other times that people say, mm, I wouldn't have done that. You know, or I wouldn't do that. Uh, I remember somebody in, in church many, many years ago, probably about 20 years ago, um, came and come quite a lot and um, wanted to do something. And he felt that God had told him this. God had told him to do this. And so he came to, to, to Brother Mathis and he asked Brother Mathis and he gave him an answer. And then he came to me and then he asked me and unbeknownst to, to, to me and Brother Mathis, I gave the exact same answer Brother Mathis did. And he said, well, that's what Brother Mathis said. I said, well, look, there you go. There's two, two good answers with it. And then he went to Mrs. Mathis and then he went to my wife, Naomi. And uh, so he went round all of us and he, he said, oh, but the same answer from everyone. And uh, I said, well, James, that's, there's, you know, there's safety in a, a multitude of counselors. So if you've asked that question and everybody's given you the same answer, chances are that that's the biblical answer that you need. But that's not the answer I'm looking for. You know, uh, so he went and did what he was going to do. And it didn't work out well. And I told him that. I said, we all tried to tell you. Well, I know, but didn't you listen? Huh? Well, there you go. Well, at least you've learned it now. So, you know, it's important that we realize that that's not what validation is. It's not trying to get someone to agree with us. It's validation is validating our emotional state. Is it right? Is it wrong? So if we sum it up, validation is saying that the emotional response that a person has to a specific situation is justified. Does that make sense? All right? So if somebody is upset because something bad has happened, that is, that's their emotional, if something bad has happened, for example, someone has died and they're, they're upset, they're sad, right? That is a justified emotional state to be in after someone's died, right? Right? So that's, that's perfectly acceptable. So their emotions are absolutely valid. And that's what we're doing through the validation stage is what emotions they're feeling. We're saying, okay, well, if, if so, you know, if someone's in that position, is that a valid emotion to have then? Yes, it is. So then we can validate their emotions. So, you know, it's fine. Anybody in your situation would feel the exact same way. If it was me, I would feel exactly the same as you. And that's when we can say the scriptures tells us it's okay to be angry. It's okay to feel. It's okay for these things. Um, we're, not tr we're not trying to heal the emotions. We're not trying to do anything like that with it. We're just saying that what you're feeling is real. Because if we do anything else, we start to gaslight. If we start to say it's not that bad, we do not know their emotional state. We don't know their mental health. For us to say it's not that bad is gaslighting. Although that's kind of the way things were done. And I remember teachers saying that to us, oh, it's not that bad. But they didn't know the emotional state of that person. You know, uh, for example, one last in our, our, our class, um, her father had passed away and mine had a couple of years before. And so I understood where she was at and something, something that was said triggered her off because it would only been a couple of weeks and she got really upset. And the teacher said, oh, it's not that bad. I said, miss, it is that bad because, I, you know, I said, I lost my father many years ago and that is exactly things like that just really don't. And she kind of took her back and realized, but you know, she didn't realize the emotional state. So if we don't realize an emotional state, we can't say things like that because it's our perception of what's going on. Their perception is entirely different, right? Now, everybody could sit in a different chair in, this, in, in the church, right? And everyone would have a different experience because not all the chairs are the same. Someone would say, oh, this, these chairs are really uncomfortable. And someone else would say, oh, it's not that bad, they're fine. The one you're sitting in, it might be fine. But you don't know if they've got piles or not. 
<laughs> you know, and so it could be something entirely different. So it's very important that we uh, realize that, that what we're trying to do is we're justifying their emotions for that, that, that thing. If their emotional state is bad and they're taking, you know, sometimes people do make mountains out of molehills, but we, this is where we figure that out. But it's not necessarily the time for us to tell them that, right? If they're having a pity party, then we can understand, like the fellow having a pity party because he's lost 10 quid on the dogs. Well, that's your own fault. You know, nay sympathy, pal. You know, it's, it's, if you've got an addiction, then we'll be willing to talk about it. But, you know, if not, then, you know, what do you expect? <laughs> These kind of things. So there's, there's things like that. Um, often the best way of validating is trying to relate to the situation. Right? So if you can relate to the situation, put yourself in, in their shoes or uh, sometimes how would you feel if it happened to you or how did you feel when it did happen to you? Therefore, you can start to relate. Now, maybe it didn't affect you as bad. But you can understand a little bit how they're feeling. Maybe it's affecting them a lot more than it is you. Right? But you can't say, oh, I just cried for a minute and then I was fine. Well, that's, that's you. They're different. Everyone's wired different. If we start to do that, we're gaslighting. Because having someone's, someone validate one's emotions can sometimes be enough to bring healing. Just to have someone just uh, someone's go, you know what? Well, that happened to me and I felt exactly the same way. Sometimes that is just enough to help a person go, you know, that makes me feel a little better. I'm not just mental. I'm not just crazy that the, the you know I, someone else understands you know that can happen um there's a situation today is a little bit different but naomi called me she said she's not having a great day sorry um and she said i just put red hot in the in the, the in the chicken i said ah huh? she said well i said we always put that in there she said, oh really i said yeah we always do that that and garlic she said that's what i've done so she was fine because she did right, she did perfect, but she, but but um, there was a bit of a, an emotional state because she thought she'd made a mistake, but there wasn't a mistake at all. So sometimes when we have that assurance, we have that um, that, uh, that validation or that acceptance or that assurance, that sometimes is enough to just to click us out or switch us out of it, and and we can be fine, knowing someone else uh, is there to help us. It's always good. Um, just to know that it's okay to feel that way can really help too. You know, because like I said, there's a lot of times in, in churches, we're told we're not allowed to feel angry. We're not allowed to feel these ways. We're not allowed to feel these negative emotions as they call them. But guess what? God created us with those emotions. The Bible says be angry and sin not. There's a difference. You know, we can be angry, but if we act out in that anger, that can cause us problems. But it's okay to be angry. Jesus got angry when he saw them desecrating the temple, buying and selling and, uh, and doing, you know, and, and defrauding people. You know, he got angry. Angry enough to turn over the tables and whip them out of there. And every right, he had every right to do so. And then they got angry at him. <laughs> right? But it's okay to be angry. It's, all, all, it's okay to have a righteous anger. It's okay to feel. And that's the message that we're trying to convey to people during this stage is it's okay to feel. You are having emotions. It's okay to feel those emotions, right? We might have, be having a more emotional state because of changes in chemicals within our body. Sometimes, some days we feel more emotional than others. Um, it, it's, that's okay, right? That's absolutely okay uh, because we have emotions. When we try to cloud up those emotions and try to hide them or try to repress them, that's when we start to have problems. But sometimes the deeper wounds is going to take more than just validation. It's going to take us through the whole process. And some things it's going to take us perhaps years to fully heal from. This is the preparation that we have to be prepared for. There's going to be a lot of stuff we're going to get healing very, very quick from, quickly from. You know, in all the years we've done it, they're, you know, they're still seeing things that, that people are dealing with. But they're far more equipped to deal with those things now than they were when they first got started. And, you know, I also, you will hear me say, there's a lot of people that I spent more time talking about doctrine, getting their truth found, truthful foundation sorted first. 
And then, then things just have started to fall into place. And I think pretty much everyone that has been successful with the program has found that, that there are certain doctrines, once they've got those in place, it's like a switch that flicks on and everything else falls into place and God just does a wonder working through the program. Um, right, so our emotions. It can be really easy to gaslight someone, right? Really easy to gaslight someone during this time. So we've got to be careful not to create. <laughs> I knew you would like that. So, <laughs> so we've got to be careful we don't create emotional damage. Okay, so right, we've got to be really careful about that. Right, because if you start gaslighting someone, you're changing the reality. You're trying to convince them that their reality is different, right? Right, and creating emotional damage. Right, put that in there for funsies because I knew Joshua would like that. Anyway, so God has created with us and within us emotions. God has created us with emotions, and He clearly shows that in His Word because it talks that He feels. And so we can know that it's okay to have emotions. When God feels, God is upset, God is angry, God, God is pleased, God is well pleased. All these things that talk about how God is and the Psalms that talk about emotions. Now, we don't have time to go through all the Psalms, but as you read the Psalm, think about all the different emotions that it's talked about. Why are thou disquieted in me? Right? We find David feels rejection, David feels anger, David feels sadness, David feels happiness, David feels rejoicing, David, you know, David feels love. There's so many different things that we read through the Psalms that we can see those emotions and we can see that they are very, very real. And so depending on who you ask, you will get a different list of emotions. If you plug an emotion list into the, the, the Google or whatever, you're going to get a variation from eight standard emotions to hundreds, right? But you will find that there's a lot of those emotions can be grouped together into categories, right? So depending on who you ask, you're going to get a different list. So there is no set list of what our emotions are. I want you to know that. Right? If somebody says, how many emotions are there, right? It don't even, right? And everyone's different, different you know, there's different levels of emotion. You can be slightly happy to being elated. You know, the English language is full of different emotional words that mean the same thing, but just different levels of it, right? You know, we, so we can, we can see that. We can all right, look, have some synonyms for happy, right? Joyous, elated, what else? glad all right so so there's there's a few that we've come up with so there's there's very there's many many different things that we can we can talk about but we must realize that the emotion that we are dealing with many years after the violation may be a secondary or a tertiary emotion all right for example all right say 20 years after something's happened you're probably not feeling the same way Right? When it first happened, you might have felt sadness and rejection. But now you may feel anger because it's moved through those stages. And certainly the stages of grief that you move through. You know, and then you know, once you've gone through acceptance and things like that, you can start healing. But sometimes you're angry, sometimes you feel rejected. Sometimes there's depression in there and things like that. And, and so you just move through those various stages. And it's very important that you do and allow yourself to move through at your own pace and nobody... Um, tries to make you go through you go through you go through it as and when you're ready so if we look at you know these emotions you know the world wants to label the label them as negative and positive emotions so we get anger fear sadness disgust pride rejection say uh, anticipation surprise enjoyment trust compassion and love so they would say that these emotions are positive and negative however is there any point where anger can be positive? Yes, I mentioned one not five, ten minutes ago. Jesus, when he went into the temple. Okay, that was positive anger. Why? Because he was cleansing because of righteousness. So that anger was not negative. It created a positive effect. All right? 
um, enjoyment. Is that always a positive emotion? What if somebody's enjoying something that's wicked and evil? Right? If somebody's enjoying gaslighting or bullying someone, it's having a very negative effect. So see, there are, not, there are no real positive and negative emotions per se. The context determines whether that emotion is positive or is negative, all right? Rejection, can that be positive? Yes, wow. Absolutely, when you believe something, you reject the nonsense. Absolutely, it's positive. So, you know, that can be a positive thing. Uh, in, in, a, in a ways, many ways we can necessarily move that from a rejection to an actual act, uh, emotion to an action as well. But that's what we're feeling. We're, we're feeling we need to reject this. You know, and the other person feeling it's rejected, well, they may feel it as negative, but to us it's positive because they need to realize that that, that is wrong. These things, what they're trying to spread there. But we can turn that around and hopefully win them to the Lord. So any of these things can be positive or negative. It just depends on the context that we look at them. Now, I don't expect you to memorize emotions, right? Because what one person will describe sadness as, another person may talk it as depression. Someone might be completely depressed and they might just think they're sad. But they might be very much depressed. And the same situation can make one person sad and another person very, very depressed. You know, so it just, it just depends on what happens. It depends on how we're wired, how we're made, how quickly we respond to things, you know, how, how much healing we have. You can see in people that have had no healing that things like rejection and setbacks have a massive effect. But those that have had healing going through are able to deal with it a lot swifter and move on. Yes, they may be on the bottom. They may really feel rejection and, and feel depression. But there's a good chance that they're going to recover a lot quicker than a person that hasn't got uh, any healing or deliverance. Now, for example, let's take surprise. Now, surprise, we might say surprise is a positive emotion, but not necessarily. If somebody jumps out of you in a dark alley, are you surprised? Yes, right? You're going to feel surprised, right? Um, you know, or uh, perhaps, perhaps someone surprises you by saying they no longer want to be your friend. Now they come and say, I no longer want to be your friend, all right? Well, first of all, that's surprise, oh, okay. And then what? Then we move down to rejection. And then we might start to feel sadness. You know, I'm not talking about for the gospel's sake, you know, for the gospel's sake, we're like, eh, okay, bye. <laughs> you know, but but uh, in this context, if somebody just suddenly, for example, a man and a wife and the, the man comes in and said, I don't want to be with you anymore. So she's first surprised and then she feels rejected. And then once, once the direction is set in, she's going to move to sadness. And then where's she going to move from there? Anger, of course. So in that respect, anger is not the primary emotion. Anger, anger is way down there on the list. All right. So um, we can see that some of these emotions are primary. Some of them can be secondary emotions because we feel them after the fact. All right. So just because we feel this way about a situation today doesn't mean to say that's exactly how we felt when it happened. Does that make sense? All right. And so when we're looking at these things and understanding emotions, we have to understand that concept that sometimes we may need to trace back through the different things that happened, asking how people felt in the moment, you know, because most people, when they get rejection or these things in the, in, in the first thing, they may quickly progress to anger, but it's usually not the first thing that they feel. It may come in five minutes, it may come in, in, in five hours, but it's usually not the first thing that they feel. Others take trust. And trust, if you trust someone and build something up, it leads to anticipation because, you know, something is going to happen. And then that turns into rejection because the thing the person didn't do, you know, you've trusted this person and you're going to meet up with them or whatever. They've planned these things and then they don't show up. What you feel, you feel rejected, right? And then perhaps you may even start to have fear. 
well, why did they reject me? Why didn't they come? Why didn't they do it? Is it me? Is it I'm the problem? And then we start going into fear because we start having a fear of rejection. So it could, it could progress to anger. It could progress to just fear to where someone is now afraid to make friends because of the rejection that they've had because they did trust someone. And they did have anticipation of that person doing something and they let them down. So now they're afraid to make new friends because they don't want to be hurt again. It's more common than you think. And so that's, that's a big thing that we've got to look at. Now, is there any point where something is non-valid? In other words, what is the only emotional state that cannot be validated? No, no, an emotional state while you're alive. So if someone is having an emotional state... There is, there is a time where it is not valid. And we call that the pity party or the tantrum. Because their emotional state to that situation is not valid to what it should be. They're in that emotional state because they didn't get their own way. That's the reason why they're in there throwing their toys out the pram. They've spit the dummy. All these things we can say. That is not valid because that is not the right response to that. Because that's a form of gaslighting because they're trying to, or manipulation it really is, because they're trying to manipulate you into doing what they want you to do by this behavior. Uh, and so it is not validated. So if someone is having a pity party, then we can't validate that. And we, have to, and we have to show us that, that is a pity party. And I will call that out every time because it's not valid. It's not valid. That behavior needs correcting. Because if we leave the pity party uncorrected, then we just enable that person to do it again and again and again. Okay? It's very important. And, you know, um, people watching that disagree, well... I'm sorry. Uh, well, not sorry, but that's just that's a behavior that cannot be validated because it's manipulative, manipulative. Um, just trying to like like um, uh, J um, Jahab and Jezebel, <laughs> Ahab and Jezebel, right? Um, right. He just threw a pity party, and she went and did what she did, and and it wasn't valid. His emotional state wasn't valid. You know, Naboth wouldn't sell his vineyard. And so he went and had a pity party. Was, did he have any right to be a, have a pity party? No, because that vineyard was Naboth's. It belonged to him. And he, and it was, and, and he went down, he tried to buy it. His emotional state would have, might have been disappointment. But it certainly was not valid to have a hissy fit in a pity party. No, no, sir. And it caused, it ended up with Naboth's murder. So it clearly wasn't the right thing. So that is very important that we watch out for the pity party. And you'll easily tell. Everybody knows when someone's having a tantrum and having a hissy fit and whatnot. And it's like, mm, no. Homie, don't play that. We're not doing that. Okay. And there's some people's emotional state, and you can see it. Their emotions do not match with the situation. Right? If the emotions don't match the situation, the chances are it's because they're trying to manipulate you because they're having a pity party about something. All right? That's why it's very important not to validate that. But if the emotions do match, and that's why I say, if you can imagine yourself in their situation and say, okay, this is where we're at. This is, this is a good thing. Uh, and as I said, study the Psalms. Look at all through the Psalms about all the different emotions that are there. And we can see pity parties in the Bible. All right? How many pity parties? Joan, Jonah. Uh, Job, yeah, all right, we talked about Ahab, Ahab, right, others, Saul had a bit of a pity party as well, all right, hmm, couldn't get his own way, yeah, many others in the scriptures we find had pity parties because they couldn't get their own way, and so they did something to try and manipulate that, it wasn't valid, so we can see that's in the scriptures too, uh, we can see it in the Psalms, that um, David talks about emotions that are real and justified and can be validated. 
Now, I'll throw this in just finally um, when we talk about empathetic stories. Now, it's very easy for us when someone is talking for us to tell a story that's very similar. And the reason why we do that is we try to show empathy. We try to show that we're relating to them uh, because we're talking about something that's similar happened to us. And sometimes that's just the way the conversation flows. However, there are some, some people that just want to make it all about themselves. They need to be the center of attention. So if you tell a story, they're going to one-up your story. Oh, well, this happened. Oh, well, this happened to me. And we've had people like that in church. You know, somebody would be there telling a story and this person, well, my mom did such and such. And you can always tell it when it starts. Well, my, and, and it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. No, nobody wants to hear that. All right. Yeah. So, but empathetic stories are really good because it helps what we can talk about is we can talk about, you know what? I remember when that happened to me and I was the same way. That's about all you have to say as an empathetic story. You don't even have to go any further. I said, you know, I've been through exactly what you're going through. I felt exactly the same way. You don't have to relate anything more to it. But that simple fact is enough to help them empathize, for you to empathize with them. There are times when we can share a story or similar experience, and these should have three goals. Right? The first goal is to show that you understand or have first-hand knowledge of what they're going through. Right? You know, when someone says, when someone often says, you know, they lost a parent at a young age, I said, I know exactly what you mean. My father died when I was, when I was eight. I'm not trying to one up them. I'm trying to show that it's there. Sometimes I don't. I said, I kind of know what you're going through. Similar thing happened to me. Um, you know, sometimes people think that you're making it about yourself. And you're not. It depends how far you go into the story. But you can use those similar stories to show and build up more of a trust because then they understand you know it's like when when um alcoholics are being counseled by someone that's never dropped, touched a drop of alcohol you know it's possible but when they've got someone else who was an alcoholic has come through it and by by the grace of jesus has been sober for many many years that's the person they're probably going to be more likely to listen to and the person that they're going to relate to more when we've had a similar experience. Number two, to show what you felt at the time and how it was valid. So if you're telling the story, you're showing that, hey, this is how I felt. I was on the bottom, I was depressed, whatever it is. You're showing them that, that you, you felt valid in your emotional state and they can too. And number three, to show how you've been able to overcome it, if you have. You know, I said, yeah, I've been through that. You know, I felt like you felt, I was, you know, in this way. But thanks be to God, through this, this, and this, I've been able to help deal with that. It helps people understand, know that you understand where they're coming from. It also helps them know that they're valid. And it also gives them what? confidence and hope that they too can get to where you're at now and that is so important hope and confidence in those things confidence in the lord hope is so precious to people that are broken because you give someone hope in the future they're far more likely to keep going <clears throat> if the person starts to think that you're making it about yourself and stop you know, if you start telling a story and they're like, you know, or whatever, that you can see in their face that they think you're, it's like, look, this is not about me. And you can do this, or you can either stop, or you can simply explain the reasoning. Listen, I'm going to tell you this story because it relates to what you did. It's not about me. It's about me showing that I've been through what you've been through. And this is how I felt. And this is how I overcame it. Would you like to hear that story? And then they might say yes, they might say no. Okay, leave it. But explain the reasoning and it might be, um, be well worth it. So your homework in your journal is see if you can trace through various emotional chains, uh, the various emotional chain uh, that you felt from the beginning of, of any violation until now. And this should help trace emotions that you may or may not be aware of. 
uh, and then validate each one saying, was I right or am I right to feel the emotion at this or that point? So that's a homework. So you can take a situation that you've been through that you might still be dealing with and you can say, okay, this is the emotional state now, but what was my emotional state when it happened? Five minutes after it happened and stays like that? Because then you might uncover, it, oh, wow, I was feeling rejection then. Oh, wow, no, that was anger there. And so we can start seeing the, we can start seeing the different stages and it's very eye-opening to do that because it helps us understand our own emotions and our own emotional state we can recognize those things okay there's those stages of grief you know there was there was the anger and there was the felt rejection there or whatever uh, and then i felt acceptance these are the, you know so we can actually start to work out and know what stage we're in with what we're going on and it also helps us to then further on if we if we intend to um to help others it really helps us uh to go through those these things okay so that makes sense yeah. okay as yahweh's kingdom of priests we are to carry out the great commission with such an assignment we will encounter and may innocently trigger a continuum of strong emotions. For this reason, understanding and applying the five V's of emotional responses will be very therapeutic and help us from hurting or harming someone unintentionally. Why? Because we read in Hebrews 4, verse 12 and 13, for the word of Elohim is living and working and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through even the dividing of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's sharp. That's real sharp. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all are naked and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom is our account. Evangelism is the witness of Yahushua which we have learned is the spirit of prophecy in Revelation 19.10b. His word is prophetic. And when we spread his word, we are functioning as a prophet by speaking his word of truth. Our goal and responsibility is to first establish where a person is at a psychological or spiritual level by relating to them and finding common ground or being a good listener. This helps to first establish a connection with the individual. It also allows you to know how much to share and when to share. You know, how much salt do you need to add? This brings in the rhythm of the relationship and prayerfully leads to holy ground. So you first establish that common ground and prayerfully it leads to holy ground. So when we share the covenant confirming gospel message, the person is often convicted in a positive or negative way. Like Pastor Bob said, you have to keep it in context, cause and effect, of how they perceive things, what is happening to their emotions, their horse, and what's happening to their thinking. What are they going back to? The rider. An emotional state, a vibe, will manifest. We need to pick up on their vibe to determine what the situation at hand requires. Do we retrieve or do we press in? Are they hungering and thirsting for more? Some, when we present the covenant confirming gospel message, may feel violated. 
His word may challenge and convict them of their present reality. They may have hyper-focused on a past wound so greatly that they keep that wound opened and unhealed for most of their lives. It may even become a crutch of avoidance. Once the person realizes what they are doing by hyper-focusing, then prayerfully healing will begin through vindication, genuine forgiveness, and the ability to be set free. They may ventilate their past experiences from exposure to the blended man-made doctrines or their cultural doctrine. At this point, if warranted, they need validation of their emotions or they may be hiding behind an emotional pity party, which would not be validated, as to not address their present condition. It's putting up a smoke screen, the pity party. That's the only emotion that would not be validated. This is where the dance begins. We can connect with the individual at a rhythmic pace in the debriefing process. Lastly, the individual must determine if an eviction notice is necessary in relation to a person, place, or thing. So I wanted that, I wanted to review that in a context of spreading the covenant confirming gospel message because his word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And I believe we have all experienced the emotional reaction to his word of truth. So last week, we discussed the three types of time. And if we apply the three types of time and how we reach others with the covenant confirming gospel message, it may require long time, forced time, end time, or a combination of times. So we see how his word, all these themes of mastery are just coming together and it's forming a beautiful symphony, a beautiful orchestra of blending together and edifying all these resources to bring to our, our understanding how beautiful and how the sanctification process can be helped when we're there for one another, when we, we share uh, words of affirmation and practice these tools, these natural laws and understand these things and, and remember the five V's when the emotional level shoots up. So long time requires us to be living examples of saving faith. There's people in, in our relational uh, circumference, if you will, whether it's family or friends, that require us to be living examples of saving faith. It, it's been a long time. We've, we've been patient and we keep on reaching out to them. It requires demonstrating the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustworthiness, gentleness, self-control. And in Acts chapter 14, two and three, we, we read in our daily devotional today where Paul and Barnabas was on their first missionary journey and in verse two, we read, but the Yehudim who would not obey stirred up the nations and evilly influenced their beings against the brothers. They stirred up strife. They did it on purpose. Does his word say to do that? Is that behavior in line with his word? Is that under his covenant umbrella? No. It was disobedience. They did a purposeful act of stirring up 
and they influenced others around them against Paul and Barnabas. So Paul and Barnabas remained a long time speaking boldly in the master who was bearing witness to the word of his favor, giving signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And then other times we use forced time in Jude chapter 1, 22 and 23, and show compassion towards some who were doubting, but others save with fear, snatching them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So there is a time even in sharing the gospel message that forced time, forced time needs to be used and, and it would be justified. In time, there's nothing like pondering that our days are numbered and we are not guaranteed of tomorrow. In time prophecies captivate our attention and especially are intriguing to those that are not believers or maybe they've just minimally been introduced to his gospel. For even if they proclaim they are not believers or atheists, they are pro proclaiming their belief. Therefore, through our Themes of Mastery series, we see how each theme forms an interwoven tapestry. They share a beautiful rhythmic dance. By being mindful of rhythmic dance, we are mindful of timing. By being mindful of how his word is sharper than any two-edged sword, we customize how we share his truth, knowing, knowing emotions will surface. It's the cause and effect. We want to keep the horse, the emotions, and the rider, the thinking, in balance. We want to be very sensitive to that. Knowing and understanding the seven keys that help us ascend to be all that he wants us to be and being aware how the five V's can help manage our emotions and prevent inadvertent gaslighting is huge. So just think about it. We make up the one new man in Yahushua HaMashiach, our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We are one body in him. A body has many parts, yet each part must rely and function in a beautiful rhythmic dance with one another. That's how our bodies function every day. Therefore, as his return draws nigh, and the days seem to display more darkness and evil, stay in the rhythm of his will, in his word, and with his people. Dance with your groom. Praise him. Laugh with him. Sing to him. He will never miss a step and you will rise and ascend above earthly situations and renew your strength on eagle's wings. Yahushua sets us free. He has set the captives free. Hallelujah and Shabbat Shalom.